want you to open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 12. And uh, uh, we've been studying the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in a variety of uh, uh, lessons and a variety of teachings and, and looking at a number of aspects concerning the Holy Spirit. But tonight, uh, we want to look at uh, probably uh, the most uh, famous uh, subject concerning the Holy Spirit, and that is the gifts of the Spirit. And we'll be going to a number of places in the Bible tonight, uh, and, uh, and hopefully we'll get some insight on the, what the gifts were meant for, who got the gifts, and which gift you may have. There's, a, there's some tremendous amount of material, though, to cover. We probably won't get it covered in one lesson, but we will attempt to get started in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse number 4. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. You and I must distinguish between the gift of the Holy Spirit, which he gave to his disciples and promised to those who know him when he said, I'll send you another, a comforter. That is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then there are gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so we got to make sure that as we hear the word gifts, we distinguish it from the indwelling possession of the Holy Spirit. That is God's gift to take his place, to stand alongside of him, to be in, in dwelling in him, to be baptized by. And then the manifestation of the helps that the Holy Spirit gives to individuals as a way to minister uh, to the church. And so with that in mind, uh, let me read to you something that one a famous preacher by the name of A.T. Pearson. Now, A.T. Pearson uh, was uh, such a well-known speaker in the uh, late 1800s uh, that when C.H. Spurgeon lost his health and uh, went to recover in an area away from London, he chose one man that he felt like could fill his pulpit for a year and actually ended up being close to two years, and that was A.T. Pearson. And he was a tremendous preacher, great uh, uh, guy that could break down the Scripture and communicate it to the crowd. He said this. Uh, he said, everyone has some gift, therefore all should be encouraged. He said, uh, no one has all gifts, Therefore, all should be humbled. All gifts are for the one body. Therefore, all should be harmonious. All gifts are from the Lord. Therefore, all should be contented. All gifts are mutually helpful and needful. Therefore, all should be studiously faithful. All gifts promote the health and strength of the whole body. Therefore, none can be safely dispensed with. All gifts depend on His fullness for power. Therefore, all should keep in close touch with Him. So he gave a great uh, rendition there of, of what the purpose of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are. They were not to necessarily impress the lost at all. They were not to be, uh, I guess, uh, uh, exalted above what their purpose was. It was to edify the body uh, and, and to bring the saints in close communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but today, as we know, uh, the gifts of the Spirit are those who call them the gifts of the Spirit. Many cases are advertised in order to, to express a supernatural event to the lost. And they'll say, you come and you get your healing. You come and get your uh, gifts of tongues. You come and you'll see the, the Spirit manifested. And they put that out there with an idea to try to 
uh, provoke lost people to coming, when in reality, uh, the Apostle Paul warns about that when he said, if people start manifesting these, so, these supernatural gifts, lost people will come in and say, y'all are out of your minds. That's what he, you know, and, and so, so we, we've got it backwards. Uh, it's pretty interesting to look at what uh, happened in the history of the church after the apostles and early disciples. Uh, they did not exhibit in the uh, maybe late first century, early second century, they didn't make a, a, an issue out of these gifts. Uh, they weren't recorded. There was very little recorded in the so-called early church fathers concerning these, these gifts. Uh, they t talked a lot about everything. They talked about the doctrines. They talked about uh, the saints, they talked about the differing groups that work within. You can find almost every uh, subject uh, exemplified in what we call the early church fathers' writings. But uh, you just won't find out hardly anything about the gifts of healing, the gifts of the uh, tongues, and, uh, all of the things that are promoted today as the evidence of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, it's imperative that we, we get an idea about what God is talking about here. And so we're going to, of course, we, we know what he said. He promised his disciples, I'm going to send you another. He's going to be with you. He'll not, I'll not leave you alone. And these early apostles, uh, he, they, he gave these supernatural gifts too. And we'll look at that. Uh, in, in Matthew chapter number 10, if you would. And let's see who, who literally got the initial charge uh, to manifest or to have in their lives manifested uh, many of these supernatural gifts. Matthew chapter number 10, and I believe we can start reading there with verse number 1. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, he didn't give that to me. He didn't give that to you. He gave it to those original 12. And he listed here, he said, now, notice those 12 disciples, look what he called them in verse 2. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. Apostle means an authorized commission one to do and work the will of God. They were specially chosen of God and uh, they were very intimate in their communication with the Lord Jesus. They spent the ministry of the Lord Jesus alongside of him. He chose them. And uh, he even says, have I not chosen you and one of you is a devil? And that was to fulfill the scripture that had been foretold many years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it just showed you the accuracy and the, and the word of God is controlling all things. And so he, he names them the first Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, uh, and Labanius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, and notice, who also betrayed him. So Judas was always listed as an outcast. He was purposely included in the group of 12 so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But never was he uh, a, a man who was uh, a, a born again or saved man uh, who uh, the Lord made a mistake on. Not so. He was from the beginning part of the whole purpose and plan of God. Now, 
As we consider that, turn with me to the book of Acts and uh, look at chapter number one. Now you can go through uh, the gospel of Mark and the gospel of Luke and see a similar, uh, the same list uh, concerning these apostles. Now, now it, it is apparent to me, and, and, and I've done my best to, to uh, search it out uh, and try not to be biased about it, but, but there were 12 apostles. Uh, today you'll go by a church and it'll say uh, Apostle John and Gloria, Apostle Gloria. Uh, you'll see stuff like that. Uh, and people, people try to pretend themselves to be some divinely appointed, uh, commissioned and authorized uh, lineage of the original apostles. And boy, do you get in a mess when you get in something like that. Because there were only 12. And uh, of course, we know that when Judas Iscariot was exposed, they were 11. And then you know what happened in the book of Acts. They gathered together and said, we're going to cast lots. We got a plan. Lord bless our plan. And uh, they picked one, uh, Matthias. And uh, if you go, you'll not... Once they picked him, you never hear anything more about him. But another one came along who was chosen and divinely appointed. It was Paul. He said, an apostle born out of due time. It was, it, he, he knew that he was one of those that God had given uh, the supernatural power to to minister the message and, and commission of God. Now, there were others listed in the New Testament where it'll mention they were among the apostles. And there's been a lot of debate over the centuries. You know, people say, well, there was the 70 sent out were apostles. No, the 70 sent out, in my view, were disciples that had a commission like many do. Many disciples have been commissioned uh, not only in the biblical term, but also uh, commissioned down through the ages uh, God sends them out, uh, and they go forth out of the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ on the fact that go into all the world and preach the gospel. So those are not apostles, but it's amazing how that uh, theologians have differed on that down through the centuries, and out of that is why we get a lot of bizarre situations uh, where people say, yeah, I'm an apostle, because why? Well, 350 years ago, this guy said that these were apostles, or 500 years ago. Well, I, I like to, my view, the Bible's the Bible. It's the Word of God. And the truth is, uh, if you can't get it off the pages of the Bible, I, I, it's not trustworthy. It's just not. Man is man. You can't, even the best of men. Um, every time uh, I, I, and I have a, a former acquaintance of mine, that was in the ministry for in this town for 30 plus years. And uh, he is, he's so bizarre now in his theology. Uh, I don't even know how he's got there, but I do know what I, what was a way he, he developed. Uh, he, he would find a book written by some man and he would say, he, and he would, he would be persuaded by that book. And then he would get up and, preach the doctrine of that book, however Aaron it was, including right now he's an anti-Israelite. He's an he's a anti-Semitic. Now at one time he was a Bible preaching, fundamental Baptist preacher. But now you wouldn't even recognize him. He, he agrees more with Islamists than he does with, and he, and he rejects Bible, he rejects independent Baptist churches and Baptist churches. But he always had a thing about where he'd get a book and he'd say, you need to read this book. You need to read that book. And pretty soon, man's books can corrupt when you're not grounded in this book here, God's book. So God's book is the chief source. Not saying that you, you and I can't read the commentaries and all that, but never do you pick up a commentary or some work by some... Uh, uh, church evangelist or some church pastor and claim it to be equal or even receive it the same as you would the Word of God. 
So in this case, uh, in Acts chapter uh, 1 there, and uh, did I say Acts chapter 1? Yeah. Okay. Acts chapter 1. Look there, if you would, in verse number, I, I think it was verse number 20. Um, yeah, no, no. Look there in verse number 1. It says, uh, former treaties have I made, O Theopolis, uh, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And, and then notice this verse 2. Until the day in which he was taken up, after he, that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments, notice, unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So there was a specific relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ through apostleship. And uh, they became extinct. Eventually they all died. And, uh, but God used them in the very beginning as the builders upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were the builders of the church. And that's why they were empowered, not only with the power from on high to speak, but they were empowered with supernatural gifts that enabled them to do things that other men could not do. And we know the apostle Paul, we know the apostles healed the sick, raised the dead, uh, gave sight to the blind, cast out demons. But God intended that to happen. And so he says, uh, he gave them uh, commandments and apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. So one of the prerequisites for being an apostle is that they were an eyewitness of the resurrection Lord. Now, the question is, how did the apostle Paul, we know Peter and James and Bartholomew, they saw him after he rose from the dead. He was seen among 500 brethren. So uh, we, we can sympathize that, but now what about Paul? Did Paul actually see him uh, in his resurrected body or did he see him on the road to Damascus where the Lord spoke to him? Now we know he was blind when it was all over with. The light was so, so bright. So... Uh, whether or not he saw him pre-event uh, uh, on the road to Damascus or at and on the road to Damascus, uh, Paul says it didn't matter. He's the last of all, Paul said. He was seen of me. So he was the apostle born out of due time. So with this uh, being a say, uh, look there in verse number three. Uh, after he get, showed many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. God communicated to these special men, these 12. Even though Matthias was there, we didn't hear anything about it, uh, but we assume he was there. And, uh, and he goes, uh, and being assembled together with them, commanded them they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he saith he, ye have heard of me. So what was he talking about? The, remember the promise of the Holy Spirit. So he gathered them together, showed himself to them, communicated truth to them in those days after the resurrection. And then uh, he said to them, he said, you listen to what I've got to say. And he said, you'll realize that I'll bring back to your memory all the things I talked to you before my crucifixion. So they began to do what we like to say, connect the dots. And it was a miracle of God that gave them the insight and the discernment to be able to formulate the truth based on pre-crucifixion messages and events they have experienced with the Lord Jesus Christ and on post-resurrection events. So they had some insight, folks, that the normal disciple didn't have. Thank God for a disciple. He's a follower and a learner. But he was not an apostle. A disciple was separate from an apostle. And so with that all being said, uh, the Lord said, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And we know what, when that was. That was there at Pentecost uh, when uh, uh, 
the Holy Ghost fell upon them and and, uh, and of course, they began to speak in other tongues and, and uh, it, it blew the minds of the other Jews that were there. They, they were stunned at what they saw and some accused them to be drunk on new wine and, and all of that. And they prophesied. They, they taught the truth about God, uh, which we take for granted today because uh, what we have is a written record of what God wants us to know. And so uh, early on, you have to list the, the spirit gifts were given uh, to the apostles. Now, look at Acts chapter number 2, and you'll see this reiterated again. Acts chapter number 2, and look at verses 1 and 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a, of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now, if you look, who is he talking about? And you'll see it's the gathering of the twelve. In fact, it was right previous to that uh, that they were casting lots for Matthias. And in that group gathered there, uh, that's where uh, the Holy Ghost fell upon them and, and gave them the utterance uh, that they uh, heretofore had not been able to speak. Now, look at verse number 13 of Acts chapter 2 and see another uh, verse concerning that. It said, And others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. <laughs> so that is how lost are untaught men discern the power of God. They can't understand it because it takes the Spirit of God revealing to them the mysteries of God. And without the Spirit of God, the natural man knoweth not the things of the Spirit of God. And so in their, in their mind, and that's why this idea of, of the gifts of the Spirit being a catalyst to provoke lost people uh, to come and hear uh, is a misnomer. Uh, uh, it, like I mentioned, it, it didn't come from God. God used these gifts to edify uh, the saints and to build them up, not to uh, uh, manifest supernatural events to lost people. Lost people don't appreciate a supernatural event. Uh, we know, uh, if you don't believe that, Listen how co people comment when something happens and maybe you know somebody that was in a near death experience or, uh, or should have been killed in a particular wreck and, uh, or uh, was, uh, should have uh, been severely injured in some type of fall. And, and, and if you say, yeah, it was a miracle of God that they didn't die. A lost person will go, you can't attribute God to everything. I've heard them say that. You can't say, why would you say God had anything to do with it? You know, uh, one time years ago, uh, when Ivan hit here, I believe it was Ivan, a friend of mine owned a, uh, a house up in uh, the corner of North Carolina and Georgia, right over the North Georgia line into Carolina near Brevard. And uh, he had a nice little home that we had visited up there that summer with him. And it had a little brook, you know, about as uh, wide as these steps made a little wider um, that ran. In, you could go out on his back deck and it, the water would splash in the rocks. Not, not bad, just enough to kind of give you some droplets. It was a beautiful little mountain home. So he called me when Ivan was going to hit here. He said, listen, why don't you take your family I'll tell you where the key's at. Why don't y'all leave Pensacola and go to my cabin and stay there to ride out the storm? And I was trying to get it together. And I've told the story before, but I was trying to get it together. And, and uh, I was frustrated because I couldn't get all of my kids uh, on board at the time to go together. So I ended up riding out of it. And... Uh, of course, my wife and I, I remember that night, as many of you might, I, we were in the laundry room closet door with the door shut, 
and pillows and mattresses, and it was bad. We didn't know if we were going to live or die that night. Well, it passed, and it went on up to that area of North Carolina like this recent storm did, and they had one of those where the rivers overran the banks, and that little brook turned into a, a gigantic, rushing tide and and on his street including his house seven all the houses on his street over seven or eight were completely washed away and destroyed and seven people died right there on that street his house was never found and it was a nice house the only thing he could find out of his entire cabin was his refrigerator. And that was miles away. And when we went up there about two months later, we rode up with him to look at it. There was a, that little brook that was about as wide as these steps, maybe a couple more, was a, a 30 foot deep gully between here and the back of the auditorium. That's how, and it had carved out 30 feet of mud. Now this auditorium is 30 feet high. So, uh, I didn't get that. Did you try again? <laughs> no. <laughs> Listen, I, I'll finish that up later. But what I'm saying is, when, I, when that happened and I, I knew what had happened, I said it was a miracle of God. God was saving our lives. Well, when I told that to somebody, they said, you can't say that. And they laughed. I thought about it because they were lost. And they couldn't figure it out that God would actually intervene in a miraculous way. And all of that's being said is to make us distinguish what are the purposes of these gifts, these gifts that we will look into and study in days coming. These gifts were given to God's people to build them up mostly in the early church to get it established, to give them a... a uh, event in their lives that that the 12 apostles had already had in the fact that they had seen a visible resurrected Christ. But the ones that were coming after them did not necessarily see that. Uh, those in Philippi didn't see it. Uh, those in Ephesus didn't see it. Those who were outside Jerusalem never saw him, a resur his resurrected body. And so God used these other things to try to solidify and build their faith up. And that's the only purpose. There was no other purpose than that. So today we've got huge denominations worldwide built on nothing more than the manifestations of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's what they do. And you, boy, they'll advertise in these campaigns and you get over in these other countries, these Central American and South American countries, and, and even in the Orient. I mean, they're not, that's all they're built around. They have very little Bible, but a whole lot of supernaturalism. And that's as deep as their Christian life will get. And God doesn't use that in the lives of uh, on a general sense, the gifts of the Spirit in these miraculous gifts. Now, he has some gifts that he specifically gives to the church for today's time. And we will see those listed. And so with that in mind, uh, look with me uh, to Ephesians chapter number 2. And uh, we'll follow this run, Ephesians chapter 2. And I believe I'm looking at verse number 12. And this has to do with uh, the uh, continuation of the establishment of who is getting the apostles and what are they for. The, uh, the apostle Paul was uh, expressing to these Gentile believers that how lost they truly were. They, were. they were not only lost, dead in trespass and sin, but at one time they were alienated from the promises of God. There was no hope for them. Uh, they weren't in the plan of God uh, for all those centuries and centuries. And so he says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 12, he said that at the time, he's speaking of these Gentiles, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, 
having no hope and without God in the world. But look at verse number 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, speaking of these Gentiles, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. He's talking about saved Jews now, where the gospel was first preached to the Jew, to the Jew first. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ, when sending out his disciples, said, don't go to the Gentiles, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't even go over there and preach those gentiles. But, but now the, the gospel message is transferring from the Jew to the Gentile. And so he says, uh, you, you're now a part of the household of God. And notice this in verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So that which was established with the uh, Jewish converts, the church, uh, could could have been the beginning there at Pentecost, probably was. Uh, that was considered to be the organism that was built upon by the apostles, those chosen, and the prophets. Now, the prophets uh, were the supernatural gift of God to the church, which specifically was used in the early church in that they didn't have a Bible. The Christians would meet. We, we, we don't even think about it. Uh, but in their day, they would meet and, and uh, uh, nobody had a Bible. I thank God later on when the epistles of the apostle and Peter and apostle Paul and others, when they began to circulate, of course, by then it was uh, 20, 30, 40 years after so what did those first Christians do uh, after the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ and after the event of Pentecost? What did they do uh, for the next 35 years? Well, God not only used the apostles, the divinely appointed sent ones to teach them God's word and God's will and God's way. He used specially designated, authorized and commissioned uh, men who were gifted with prophecy. And that's why there in the book of Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number 11, it gives us uh, the list. He says in Ephesians 4 verse 7, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended... What is it but he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above heaven that he might fill all things. So there, he's proven that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was the one who died, was buried, and, and went into the lower parts of the earth and led captivity captive. Those are the Old Testament saints that have been held there uh, in paradise uh, that Lazarus had dealt with the... Uh, with the Lord Jesus in that, uh, that event uh, where he looked across there and the he was in the bosom of a Abraham. Well, here it says, once he ascended, he gave gifts and he gave some apostles. Yeah, he did. We know their names. And some prophets. Those are the ones that had an, an uncanny ability and supernatural gift to speak. And notice, and some evangelists, God used men who went around the world to begin to preach, around the known world again to preach the gospel, the good news of the events of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He gave them. He gave them to the church. And notice this, and some pastors and teachers. And so they were men uh, that were gifted uh, especially, uh, he doesn't uh, put a comma between pastors and teachers, which apparently uh, is that pastors are teachers. Pastors who, who feed the flock of God and they teach the Word of God, apt to teach. And why did he do it? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, 
Paul told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. And so as the church foundation was built on by the prophets and the teachers, uh, then, uh, then the d new converts came in. Uh, they were taught the word of God. They were uh, helped and supervised and, and kept together by these pastors and teachers. Now, as we close, I want you to notice something in 1 Corinthians because this, to me, uh, gives you an idea about who the prophets are and what did they do. The Apostle Paul gives us a definition of what was the gift of prophecy. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 2. He says this, And though I have the gift of prophecy, what is it? When I got the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, God gave men in the early church called prophets who was able to stand up in the congregation of believers and tell them that which they did not at the time have a written copy of. There were no epistles, but they still had to have the information to edify them and build them up and learn to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so a prophet is one who could understand these mysteries. There were, listen, we take them, we've heard them all our lives. But remember the Apostle Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. And then he talks about the mystery of the church. These, these people had to have somebody to articulate what happened. Uh, we hardly relate because we were born and raised in an organism called the church that we've taken as assumed it's always been. But it certainly has not been in the form that it is today. We don't have to. They were, there weren't centuries to look back on. There weren't grandpa was a preacher and he taught me. There wasn't anything. Just a bunch of uneducated, spiritually uneducated, uh, uninformed, and naive bunch of new believers that knew that Jesus had died for them and was buried and rose again. That's all they knew. And that's why when Paul wrote there in the book of Hebrews, he said, let us move on. <laughs> let's, let's learn to uh, leave the uh, original principles and move on to learn more things in the Lord Jesus. And so uh, we'll look at the actual gifts and list them, and you'll see there were some that ceased. And he, and he list, they ceased. Once the supernatural uh, cohesiveness that was formed through the apostles and prophets, when they died off, uh, uh, these gifts began to disappear. And I'll just mention that you, just like tongues, there are 21 New Testament epistles and only one of them mentions tongues. What happened? In the early church, it was a big deal. The first year or two. But after a while, when the apostles died off, they ceased. But they had other things. They had copies of the epistles. They passed them around. That's pretty amazing how God worked it, you know? And so we thank him for it. Let's be closed tonight and appreciate you coming out. Lord, as we uh, move forward, we pray that you would enlighten us in this study and help us to uh, get a grasp and understanding of just how good you've been to your people. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.